Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 450, and today I'm joined by Patrick McFarlane. Pat, welcome back to the show. Hey, glad to be with you, Kyle. Yeah, I'm happy to have you back on. I think, you know, maybe other than Will Porter, I've been interviewing you longer than anyone else. I know we've done a yeah. bunch of these over the years now, and quite a few of the interviews that we have done have been about documentaries you made. And this new one that you got here, Pat, Oppenheimer, The Truth, Part 1, is absolutely fantastic. Um, I really, you know, not to diminish any of your other work, but I do think it is your best one to date. The The production quality of it is excellent. The script is absolutely excellent. I recommend everybody go and watch it. Uh, but we want to talk a little bit about that today, and then I guess a little bit of what you have in store because this is part one. So there, there's more. So I want you know, you know, you to tease the audience a little bit, tell them what's coming, what else they could learn here, and then also you know to just talk about other nuclear related stuff. Uh, so before we get into the conversation today, Pat, me and you both work at the Libertarian Institute, and we are holding our fundraiser right now. So. Everybody, if you check out Pat's documentary here, the Oppenheimer documentary, and you like it, you know, what allows Pat to do this is the fact that we have funding at the Libertarian Institute. And so uh, if you want to, libertarianinstitute.org slash donate and, and head on over and make a donation. So, you know, not only I could keep writing and, and doing all the great things I'm doing, but uh, Pat could keep making these great documentaries. So, Pat... I guess let's start off, you, you know, this documentary isn't necessarily, at least not part one, obviously, uh, the, the whole entire coverage of, you know, the Manhattan Project and who is Oppenheimer and everything like that. And, you know, this is really just a, a, a very good intro into U.S. nuclear experimentation. So, Pat, I, I guess what what did you kind of hope was going to be the scope of part one? And uh, what was maybe the, the biggest, like, revelation that you learned that you were either shocked about or you felt like you just had to tell people? Yeah, well, first off, I just have to give credit to my producer, Mises Pieces, because none of this would be possible without him. And he just did a tremendous job. Um, and so I'm really grateful for his help. But, when it, yeah, when it comes to the documentary itself, I really um, – the main takeaway here is that people usually say, well – the Manhattan Project, we had to do it. We had to make the atomic bombs because the purpose was to protect America, to save American lives, and to prevent, uh, you know, an invasion of Japan. That That's the specific use of it, but moreover, to protect our national security and to project force after World War II. And if that were true, then all the Manhattan Project scientists would have had the best intentions, right? They would have they would have been um, bought into the whole American protectionism, doing duty and service and all those types of things. Well, when you actually get into it, you look at some of the deeds that they, they did in creating the atomic bomb and then afterwards, and you realize that, well, maybe it's not about protecting American citizens, because if it was, they wouldn't have injected American citizens with plutonium without their consent. And... I didn't cover this in the documentary. Uh, I'm probably going to further on, but just the downwinders, the people who lived around the Trinity test site who were exposed to radiation, and a lot of them um, got cancer, and a lot of them passed away because of this. And it really is a shame that people who apologize for the atomic bomb or defend it and say that all of it was necessary and that the United States, you know, war is hell and we just have to do what we have to do. Well, if it really is about protecting American citizens, why did we treat them with such abandon? Yeah. So Pat, you, you go through a lot of the experimentation. Uh, so, some of it was shocking. Uh, so, so what were some of the things that, again, that you learned here that you thought, uh, were really important to, and they had to put in there? I think discovering the pasts of the people who were instrumental in the Manhattan Project itself, especially J. Robert Oppenheimer and some some of the more unsavory things from his past. I mean, I do talk about him being a communist at some point, but I don't think that that's really as shocking as the fact that he tried to like poison his supervising professor at Cambridge University that he was diagnosed with profound schizophrenia. 
He was almost expelled because he tried to poison his teacher with cyanide from the university laboratory. Um, he had like a, a mental breakdown during his first year of graduate study at Cambridge where like people would come into the laboratory and he would be muttering to himself and he would like collapse in fits to the floor of the of the labs and like roll around. And a lot of it, and I'm not making this up, like this is in Kai Bird's documentary, his, his, uh, his sorry, rather his uh, biography of J. Robert Oppenheimer that the movie with Christopher Nolan was based off of, um, would talk about Oppenheimer's sexual frustration during this time. And it really seemed, I don't know if it was some kind of a Freudian thing, um, but he would get extremely jealous of his male friends who got girlfriends and to the point where he tried to strangle one of his friends with a trunk strap um, during the first winter of his first year at Cambridge. Um, so it was that, and then it was all these other figures that were prevalent in the Manhattan Project Health Division who had a history of doing um, questionable behavior and kind of destroying medical and scientific ethics even before their time in the Manhattan Project, um, doing these exper human experiments with radiation that were just uh, flagrantly unsafe, and they didn't give informed consent to uh, the their test subjects because, you know, as a part of informed consent, you have to make sure that everyone understands the risks of the procedure and the nature of the procedure and um, consent to it. But they there's no record that they really uh, did explain these things, and furthermore, people couldn't consent because they didn't know exactly what the the dangers were of these experiments. So those were some things I, I think it's important for Americans to know about because, you know, everyone I talk to, they have no idea that this took place. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The Manhattan Project is just this, like, secret thing that everybody assumes, like, they, you know, did a whole bunch of scientific work and then rolled out to the desert, detonated a bomb, and that's, that's how we got it. You know, no, no uh, unsavory... Uh, things going on now pat you, i guess one part of this that i find so interesting is all this informed consent stuff this is in uh you know as i guess you know world war ii is going on so d was there like um i don't know any comparison to the nazis at the time or because i mean this is you know really bad human uh, experimentation here that they're doing which is of course uh, you know, one of the worst horrors of the Nazis and the, the Japanese regimes. Yeah, so these experiments really began getting press coverage in the 90s when Eileen Wellsom published her book, The Plutonium Files, covering the these plutonium injection experiments. And what she really did was some real high-class quality investigative journalism. She came across this and poured through thousands of paper documents and did these FOIA requests and went to libraries. She tracked down the actual individuals and their families who had been injected with plutonium. And she published this big expose on it. And it actually caused a, it spurred a congressional inquest into um, an investigation into what exactly happened. And so if you go on the Atomic Energy Commission's website, there is a bunch of documentation about this and about that congressional inquest. And in it, they they remark upon, and there were New York Times articles published at the, at the time as well. Some of them I cite directly and link in my transcript of the documentary, um, saying that the Atomic Energy Commission specifically condemned Robert S. Stone, um, one of the Manhattan uh, Project doctors, um, in his experiments in irradiating people who had cancer and um, subjecting nursing home patients to um, x-rays without medical expectation of medical benefit. And it notes in the in these investigation, the Atomic Energy Commission uh, investigations, essentially that some of the Manhattan Project scientists were getting a little nervous when the Nuremberg trials were going on because they realized that a lot of what the Nazi scientists and Nazi officials were being charged with in terms of medical experimentation uh, was actually not dissimilar to the same kinds of things that they were doing over here. And so that's another thing to add into this whole 
mythos that, oh, well, the atomic bomb was created to protect America, to protect Americans. Well, at the same time, you know, our, our scientists were performing much in the same way that the, uh, the Nazi medical doctors were, and that Japan was during their, uh, their infamous Unit 731 medical experimentation. Um, so I think, and before I forget, Kyle, another main undercurrent of this, and one thing I tried to talk about in the documentary and will expand upon in part two, was essentially the radiological weapons program and the development of radiological weapons that were occurring during the Manhattan Project as well. This was a side project uh, that was being developed, and it was the true purpose for these radiological um, these plutonium inject injection tracer experiments to figure out how long it took for radioactive material to be excreted by the body and what lethal doses were. Because J. Robert Oppenheimer wrote specific um, letters documenting a desire to create radiological weapons that would create mass area casualty events and to basically salt the earth and make large areas of civilian infrastructure uninhabitable um, and unusable by a potential enemy. And I think that the the film, Christopher Nolan's film, really tries to portray Oppenheimer as the sympathetic individual who wrestled with the morality of using the bomb and regretted his part to play in it. And I just think that's a lot less credible when you know that he essentially had premeditated creating these horribly destructive devices that would be used primarily on civilians. Yeah. And y yeah, he, he doesn't come across as a sympathetic figure in your documentary, even if he were, you know, even if, you know, at the end of this, you do a, a final thing on, you know, his opposition to actually using the bomb in Japan and things like that. Uh, I don't think he's going to come across in any way as really somebody we should feel bad for or pity or somebody of, uh, you know, who wrestled with morality because people who wrestle with morality don't do these kind of things that you're outlining here. Um, okay, Pat. So the documentary, uh, very good. I guess, when can we expect part two? And then do you have an idea of what, what you're covering or focusing on in the second part? So I would like to say that part two is going to come out in September sometime. Um, to be completely honest, I haven't started the, the script for part two. Part one was really a year and a half in the making. And at some point I was just like, well, I just have to get this out. It just has to be done or else all this time and effort will be wasted. Um, so I just had, we just had our third child and we're really kind of adjusting to what it means to be outnumbered as parents. And so that is difficult. Um, <clears throat> but I would, I would like to, to be working on it and try and get it out at least in this fall sometime. And part two is going to be covering the actual plutonium injection experiments um, and in, in pretty good detail and, and get into some of the other uh, like Army Chemical Corps experiments that took place during the Cold War. And, you know, specifically there were instances in, in, um, in Wisconsin, my home state, where they would have GIs crawl through radioactive fields and see how that affected them. Um, but also I think you and I, Kyle talked about the, uh, zinc cadmium sulfide dispersal experiments in places like St. Louis. Um, so I want to touch on that a little bit because it is tangentially related to this whole, um, basically the, the radiological weapons program, which is what the documentary is really about. Um, and then part three, I envision covering Eileen Wellsome and her exposure of, of these facts, because I really think that she's heroic and someone to be celebrated for doing this. Um, and yeah, so, so that's kind of where the roadmap is going. And overall kind of the theme too, is I'd like to, per, to, to get across is why is it that, you know, someone like Ted Bundy or, or Jeffrey Dahmer or someone like that is really demonized in the press and treated as being this horrific monster when they killed 26, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, I think, killed 26 people or John Wayne Gacy killed, you know, in, in the double digits of people. But someone like Oppenheimer is directly responsible for killing hundreds of thousands. And we create basically a puff piece film about him trying to humanize him. It just the disconnect there just 
why is he not treated the same way? And I, I understand that maybe, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer was maniacal, right? Um, and, and Ted Bundy was maniacal, but I think that they should be in the same classification of treatment as these figures. Yeah, no, I was uh, reading a, a recent piece on the down, downwinders, Pat, and I think I sent this over to you. But one of the things they point out that you really don't even consider, right? Because I, I think our natural inclination is just to kind of count the bodies. How many people got cancer from being downwind of the, the nuclear experiments and, and then died from that? But that's really just scratching the surface because all of these people you know, they have millions of dollars worth of treatment they needed. And so, I mean, not only the, the I'm sure, traumatic effect of, you know, kind of confronting death when you have cancer um, and then, you know, the lost wages that you have from going to your treatments. And, you know, if you're if you're a man and you work any kind of physical job, you may not be able to work at all or, you know, have to really scale back what you're doing. And, and so, you, you know, but talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars for all of these families, you know, for a lot of families, that means losing their home, bankruptcy, uh, you know, divorce. I, I mean, just really, you can't even calculate the effects at least, you know, this isn't to downplay serial killers, as you were saying before, but you know, I mean, the, the victims are identifying, you know, their immediate families and things like that too, but it's not this entire states full of people that were directly harmed and financially burdened, significantly financially burdened, medically burdened by the, these experiments. It, 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 it's un, unreal when you really try to calculate uh, the damage that was done. And it continues to be done, right? Um, just a couple of weeks ago in The Nation, there was this article about a school uh, in northern St. Louis uh, County where they, they had to shut it down because there is like background levels of, of you know nuclear waste in a creek that runs behind the school and this is a legacy of the manhattan project and so you know even today there may be some kid that contrasts childhood leukemia in st louis because he was playing in that creek and then that bankrupts the family i mean you know oppenheimer body count that that's still going up here pat yeah and the, the problem with the intraceability of it, you know, ironically, because they were running human tracer experiments, but the intraceability of the harm is severely detrimental and it allows the government to be able to downplay that harm as well. Um, I did a TikTok um, talking about the downwinders just a little bit, uh, but the fact that even, even the Manhattan Project and Lieutenant Colonel General Leslie Groves, he shortly after the fact, did acknowledge that there, they missed farms and they missed families who were in kind of the radiation radius. And he said, oh, well, you know, we went, we sent people out to their farms and no one was, no one was harmed outwardly. None of the families were outwardly harmed, even though livestock had suffered radiation burns and, and were bleeding, you know, skin bleeds and things like that. But it's not enough for government scientists to go to someone's homestead and just check to see, oh, well, I don't see that there's anything wrong with you, um, so therefore there's nothing wrong with you, you know. Um, and there's there's other people who have, there was a Twitter thread that I saw of the daughter of one of these downwinders saying, well, my mom died from cancer from the first atomic tests, and was also talking about, well, the Los Alamos ejected natives who were already living there to create, you know, this, this, uh, the Manhattan Project facilities. And then you get into all these other ancillary effects, like, you know, rejecting, removing people from their land. Uh, you know, you could talk about the Marshall Islands and the atomic tests that took place there that are still affecting, uh, natives there, you know, just thinking that, any any island in the Pacific could be ours to do what we want with it is just not the right way to think. And and there's no mention of it in in these films where everyone is taken with the legacy of Oppenheimer, and it's just kind of disgusting. Yeah, yeah, I know. I I mean they detonated nuclear weapons in the ocean. Uh, they've essentially blown islands off the face of the map with nuclear weapons. They've donate detonated I think dozens or so above ground in the United States, hundreds below ground, which I'm sure 
there there's more impact to that than we know i mean Remember, Pat, this is a government program, right? right? It's going to be run inefficiently. There's going to be corruption. Some official is going to spill some nuclear waste somewhere or allow or know there's more nuclear radiation or seepage or whatever going on. And he's not going to admit it so he could get the next promotion in line. Th- yeah. This is this is government. It happens all the time. Um, you know, we're, we're absolutely lucky that government hasn't killed more people with these weapons than they have. And of course, Pat, there's not only, I guess, this part of the legacy that we're focusing on, but of course, if they're actually used, right? Everybody likes to pretend like, oh, Pat, we just have to keep around nuclear weapons in case an asteroid is coming towards earth and we need to blow it up or something like that, because it's really unthinkable to actually, think that you would use a nuclear weapon on a city that you would vaporize a million people off the face of the planet in an absolute instant you know why and then millions more will probably you know have their skin slide off in the coming days and then they'll die of some kind of horrible radiation death so let's talk a little bit i guess about about the use of the bomb because as you said uh, the Oppenheimer film, I guess, tries to portray him as sympathetic as somebody who actually opposed using this weapon he created. And so, Pat, like the movie ignores all the horrible stuff that went into the creation of this weapon. And then it just makes it, I guess, look like a scientific feat uh, in, in a great achievement. And then something that the scientists didn't actually end up in the end wanting to use. And so... But but today, if you actually, you know, make that argument, like, say, on Twitter or especially on Facebook, oh, imagine making this argument on Facebook, uh, you're going to get absolutely slammed as somebody who just doesn't understand history and how the nuclear bombs actually saved lives. Pat, can you believe it? If we didn't have the atomic weapons, we would have had to invade Japan and then hundreds of thousands of Americans and millions of Japanese would have died. But when you know, we only had to kill about 250,000 uh, in just two cities with these nuclear weapons. So uh, what, what do you think about that? I think that for some reason, Americans are so emotionally tied to this justification that, well, yeah, it was a bad thing to do. and But war is hell. We just have to, you know, we don't have any moral blame for it because war is hell. And that's just what happens in war is that you vaporize hundreds of thousands of civilians. And I think that the absolute, I don't know, just bananas thought that the only way to defeat an island nation, an island nation, is to kill a bunch of civilians with a bomb. Like, I I mean, you couldn't perhaps blockade the island and cut off any military imports or their access to oil or anything like that. I mean... At this point in time, the the Japanese military was pretty in pretty dire straits. I mean, I I collect um, I collect military surplus firearms, and one of the things that is well known is that there are these last ditch rifles. They call them like a Type 99 Japanese Arasaka. Um, there's as the war goes on, the production quality gets worse and worse and worse, and they start cutting corners. And there's parts, you know, there's pieces that are missing from the the rifle, like no chrome line barrels anymore, and the butt stocks are made out of wood instead of metal, um, and, and things like that. So, just the thought that the only thing that we had to do um, was to to vaporize civilians, and we couldn't have just waited a bit longer and and tried negotiating. And this dismissal of the idea that the Japanese were ready to surrender, but they weren't willing to surrender unconditionally. Like this obsession with unconditional surrender um, that was decided, I believe, in 1943 by the Allied leaders that we would accept nothing less than complete surrender. Like they hadn't figured out the folly, essentially the folly of the Treaty of Versailles and doing it the first time. And we're just, you know, we're just living with the consequences of still living with the consequences of unconditional surrender. Yeah. And you, you know, people will point out too, that one of the only conditions that Japan really wanted was to keep the emperor. And I believe the U S um, essentially allowed that to happen in, 
anyway. So, you know, in that sense, it was unnecessary. And then a lot of people will argue, too, and I think are correct in saying that a big part of the reason why the U.S. did it this way was to force Japan to surrender, not just unconditionally, Pat, but unconditionally to the United States rather than to the United States and the Soviet Union, sure. which was preparing to move its forces on uh, Japan, as the U.S. Uh, made the Soviets promised to do, by the way, that after they are done mopping up the Nazis, they are supposed to come uh, help out with the Japanese, and then that caused uh, the Americans to panic and, and take the nuclear option there. And of course, you know, what we've seen in, in the world since this is a, a legacy of these weapons, really, where the U.S. and Moscow have been more or less the centers of power, but basically any country that's able to obtain these weapons, uh, you know, commands a lot of power in the world. And you really trace it back all to this one government program. Now, uh, you know, I guess people will point out that other countries could have developed it and things like that. And I, I guess that is, you know, some truth, but that we praise the figure who invented uh, potentially the, the weapon that wipes humanity off the face of the planet and burns the human race to an end is a really, really interesting thing, Pat. So anyways, do you have anything else on your documentary that you want to mention today? If not, make sure you tell everybody really how they could watch it, where they could find it. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think that um, I, I this is always kind of how I envisioned when I started doing my show. I kind of envisioned that I would be doing projects like this. And now I have the ability to do it because of uh, support from you guys donating to the Libertarian Institute. I mean, the funds that went to pay for this were from the funds that I get from the Libertarian Institute to do what I do. And so it allows me to justify that expenditure because, you know, once you do, when you do podcasting, once you buy the equipment and get that all set up, um, it's pretty much, well, we just plug in, we press a button and record and then spit it out. I mean, there's like hosting fees and stuff, but they're pretty minimal. With this, though, this kind of stuff takes funds and time i don't have the skills to do production value like this and so having having the producer on my side having mises pieces helping me really makes high quality stuff like this possible and uh, i would just urge everyone to go on over to libertarianinstitute.org forward slash donate and uh, help help me create more content and help us create more high quality stuff like this all right and i just want to you know, talk up the documentary one more time here, Pat, because this is the, the production quality of this, because you have a really nice camera, you know, you've taken the time to buy really nice equipment. So your voice sounds absolutely great. The script is really good. You, all of your scripts have been good. This is something that you have a talent with is writing scripts for documentaries. And Thank now you. you just have the equipment and the people around you to really amp up the production value because I, I mean, I'm sure it would take a, a huge amount of time to do that all by yourself. So for anybody watching who has seen a documentary on Netflix, I think this could be in production value, maybe minus having background music, right? And, and honestly, as somebody who is just a fan of documentaries, I prefer without the background music because that's how you get so much emotional manipulation is and how you can make, some people sound so sympathetic and other people sound sinister. And so Pat, thank you so much for, for how, you know, what a great job you're doing with these documentaries. And I think it makes our arguments look so much more powerful for them to be presented in this way. So everybody check it out. If you like it, support the Institute and share it because, you know, not only do we need to get uh, Pat a little bit more funding so he can make these things more often, uh, but we also need to get it out there to more people because this is really high quality content. Uh, some of the best stuff being made in the libertarian movement. And I know, you know, people talk up Dan Smotz's videos and stuff like that, which are really excellent. And, and this captures a lot of that same, uh, you know, production quality. So Pat, again, thank you so much, man. Th thanks for doing the thing. Thanks for being a part of the Institute and uh, thanks for coming back on the show. And, I, I, you know what, I've guessed we've probably done probably a few dozen of these over the years. I've almost done probably a thousand episodes now. So, uh, and again, other than maybe Will Porter, I think I've probably been interviewing the longest, Pat. So, um, 
anyways, great, great to see you uh, accomplish such a thing here because I, I know what kind of you know work you could do, and, and this was just phenomenal. So, everyone, uh, libertarianinstitute.org, find Pat's documentary there, find my work there, uh, donate there, and uh, we'll be back with more shows later in the week. Thanks, Kyle.